Hey everyone, I'm here with Jordan Vote Roberts. Did I do that right? That's me. Yeah, look at that. Um, English is my second language. You know this. Mm -hmm. I've been learning this slowly and surely. I'm totally messing around. Dude, I'm still struggling with English. Dude, I am so happy uh, you came in today. I haven't seen you since we did a screening of Kong Skull Island. It's been a minute. Exactly. Um, you have been uh, busy since before that screening and until now working on this thing called Metal Gear. I have. I uh, Well, <laughs> this thing has been consuming my brain since I was a child, but um, I've been actually working on it actively at trying to make it a movie for the last five years. I was going to say, it's been like multi years. It's not one of these overnight, like you just got on it six months ago. No, this was something that I fought for way back in the day. After Kings of Summer, I saw a Metal Gear book on an executive's table and I said, I want to do that. And they said, there's no way you can do that. <laughs> And then I made it my mission to sort of prove to them how deeply uh, knowledgeable my dumb brain is about all things Metal Gear and how to try and translate all things Metal Gear into sort of the perfect movie. Well, that, that's something I want to get into. We, we're going to discuss, you, you have a whole bunch of uh, uh, concept art, which we're going to jump into. But I think a lot of people are wondering the, the video game movie, the video games transitioning into movies has been a problem. And yep. it has not, there hasn't been that, maybe there, ha, ha, do you think there's been a home run yet? Well, the three examples that I always give that I think are home runs are actually not based on video games, but they, I think they're video game movies. And that's, I think Kubo is basically a video game movie. It, it, it follows the mechanics of Zelda and quests and, and armor upgrades and bosses much in the same way a Zelda game does. Um, Snowpiercer, I think, fundamentally taps into the mechanics of a left to right side scroller. Everything is going left to right the entire movie. Every train car represents a new level, a new stage. Um, and then Edge of Tomorrow, I think, oh. taps into the the sort of meta mechanics of video games, the way that you respawn, the way you go back to a checkpoint. And so I think there have been three seminal films that in a more meta way tap into sort of what you feel when you play a game. They just don't happen to be based on video games. Sure, uh, but you agree that thus far, something that's called, yes. you know, like, there have been a couple. I actually think the Silent Hill movie has like some pretty cool stuff in it. There, there are a couple movies that have like decent moments, but yeah, nothing, nothing has really, I think, hit on that initial like Blade or X Men level, and certainly nothing has hit on that sort of like Dark Knight level. Completely. Um, one of the things about Metal Gear and uh, there, it's basically like, like a lot of the game is you're, you're, it's stealth. It's you know trying to do stuff without getting noticed. How and there's also a complicated history with that franchise, with the backstory and everything. So I guess my question is, where do you begin in that, at the, the, like where, it's so daunting. Uh, that's a question that I've been thinking about <laughs> since I was a kid. And yeah, it is famously, the thing about Metal Gear is it, it's intentionally sprawling and it's intentionally dense and it'd be super easy to just take one sliver of it or try and do too much at once and you know we've spent the last little bit really trying to figure out to me the most um uh, kojima-san inspired way to tackle as much of that uh story in a way in it with through a device that i think allows you to tap in um and how to put this? How to put this without spoiling it? <laughs> right. I, I definitely don't want to get you in yeah, trouble. Because there's a lot that I can't say. But regardless, we have a device that I think allows us to um, respect the breadth of the franchise, respect the sprawling nature of the franchise, respect the somewhat convoluted nature of the franchise at times, but then to still show you the mirrors. And what I mean by that is like all of those timelines fundamentally exist because they, they show the repetition of war throughout time. They show the repetition and the cycle of pain throughout time. And so it, it's almost impossible just to tell one story now because you need the, the, the full through line of what this game is about. And there's a, there's a pacifism, there's a, there's a tortured nature to all of these characters. And so you need to figure out how you give it enough context without 
completely overwhelming an audience with like, oh my God, that's too many things. But then you also can't be so micro focused that you don't understand the spirit of the franchise. Sure. When you, there's a lot of games. Mm -hmm. Is there one that you particularly looked at in terms of this is the one that really I want to, I want to examine? Um, Metal Gear Solid for the, the, PlayStation 1 is certainly a seminal game for me, and I think a big reference point in this. I also think that there are elements of Snake Eater, which is Metal Gear Solid 3, uh, that takes place back in the 60s, that is a huge reference point. But also, I think some of the things that people might not think about is we're actually going back to the original Metal Gear and um, the sequel to that. You know, those were sort of MSX games that aren't polygonal, that aren't 3D, you know, so it's easy for a lot of people to miss those games, but some of the plotting and the mechanics and the, um, the dynamics in those games are actually very fundamentally important to um, our approach. Sure, I, I guess with a game like Metal, one of the problems I think for developing a Metal Gear Solid movie might be that you need to design something that's gonna to appeal to the hardcore gamer, someone who's played all the games or really knows the universe, and also design something that the casual person that has never played the game would all of a sudden say, oh wow, this is really cool, now I wanna go play the game. Yeah, but you know what, to me, I think that genre has evolved, and filmmaking's a language, right? Language evolves over time. The things that people watch now and completely understand, 30 years ago an audience might, might have watched them and not understood what the hell was happening. Like cinema evolves. Our understanding of genre evolves. Now we have talking raccoons and talking trees in genre movies and 10 years ago, even three years ago, that seemed like a crazy idea. To me, what you just said is actually, I think, one of the things to lean into. I think there's a way to lean into all of the oddities and the quirks and the idiosyncrasies that make up Metal Gear. And people forget Metal Gear is goofy. It's filled with, like, military surrealism. It's filled with these walking, talking, philosophical ideologies of characters. It, it's filled with, like, almost horror tones at times. And that's all in this container of this super serious sort of military game. And I think by fo fo like finding the right access point and leaning into all of those things that I think appeal to the, the hardcore, I think there's a way to translate that stuff and those actually end up being the exact things that a general audience falls in love with. I think those are the things that you, instead of being afraid of them, instead of running away from all of those, those oddities and those quirks, those are Metal Gear. And so for me, my job is to figure out how to, how to protect those things. So not only the, the core fan base is like, that is what I fell in love with, that's what changed my life that long ago, but it's also what the casual person says, oh my God, I've never seen something like this. And so when I get into an Uber, you know, in four years, hopefully I see someone with a little Cyborg Ninja or Revolver Ocelot or Solid Snake little action figure sitting on the dashboard. You know, or you walk around and like a bunch of kids who right now are wearing Thor t-shirts are wearing, you know, Sniper Wolf t-shirts or, you know, Big Boss or whatever. Like to me, it actually is about leaning into the quirk. Sure. Leaning into the oddity. You, there are some iconic characters in the in the in the game series. Uh, how much are you trying to put in? You know, like how many of these characters are you already thinking about in terms of putting in? Um, I know exactly how many. <laughs> um, I am trying to find the right threshold where I think Metal Gear is a it's a franchise that Snake and boss, these the sort of two figureheads of the, of the franchise in theory, they define themselves based on the relationships of the people around them. And so much of the game actually ends up being the tragedy that these characters experience as you go through and you have a boss fight. And instead of feeling like you've accomplished something, you feel a sense of loss, which is such a unique Metal Gear feeling. And so, it's important that those characters are surrounded by a roster of people. And so we're finding the exact right amount of people where we can introduce enough of them that it feels robust, that we can define Snake or Boss through these characters, but not enough to get lost. You know, it's a, it's a very delicate balance where you feel like everyone can have their due, everyone can have an arc, everyone can have their, um, 
the, you know, they can be treated with the iconic nature that they are. I, I, well, I guess the big, the, the, the next thing I want to know about is where are you in the screenplay process? We just turned in the first draft. Uh, Derek Connolly wrote it, uh, and it is, in my opinion, remarkable. And I would say that um, even if I wasn't involved in this movie, I think I would, I would read that script and say, holy shit because I think it represents a, a different approach to a video game movie. I think it represents a different approach to um, how a traditional three-act structure is, is um, put on screen. I just think it's very inventive, and for me, like I read it and I get excited. So we're just now doing some revisions on that and then going to send it back to Sony, and hopefully they dig it. <laughs> well, one of the things about this is that Metal Gear, let's be honest, this is not a $20 million movie. This is no. a big, big movie. So how much is knowing that this has to be made at a cost impacting the way you guys are writing it and the way you're coming up with your story? I mean, in a perfect world, I would love to do the fiscally responsible R-rated version of this that you can do for a price. I would rather lean into the stylized <laughs> manga blood sprays. I would rather lean into some of the more uh, brutal or challenging philosophical ideas in the franchise, um, but do it for a cost. And, and so you can make the riskier version. And that's actually less about the R rating because, you know, you certainly could make this movie as a PG-13 film. I, I think it should be R, but regardless, it's about doing it for a price so you can make the riskier balls to the wall Kojima-san version of this, the version that represents the, the game. See, this, this is the thing. I think that one of the reasons Deadpool, let's use that as an example, mm -hmm. that was made for about 55 million and... A little bit more than that, but yeah. Sure, but you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Uh, but you're right. That, uh, blur... <laughs> That's what the studios like yeah, to say. Exactly. Yeah. Let's just say, but it was made for under 100. Sure. Let's say that, and it was able to push boundaries. And my question is, do you believe that a movie like this and what you, the, an R-rated version of this doing what you want to do, can it be made for under 100? Um, I'm a, look, I come from indies, man. I come from like no money at all. I come from no budget. You know, I, I come from carrying my own gear, moving my own lights. <laughs> so my goal would be to get this movie made and that's less about the R rating. It's more about taking the risks. You know, I, I just genuinely believe that audiences want new things like you know it's not just deadpool it's logan it's sure. you know it's 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 all of the things that are pushing boundaries like that and so i think metal gear is one of the most unique franchises on the planet and in order to preserve all of the things that are metal gear about it and to slowly not chip away at that to not just slowly try and turn it into gi joe to not turn it into mission impossible to not turn it into james bond there's so many different reference points someone could look at metal gear and misinterpret what it is like instead of saying yeah it's kind of like tarkovsky and david lean meets like mctiernan you know like or like <laughs> david lynch meets michael bay <laughs> like metal gear is such a bizarre fusion of things and my job is to protect that fusion. Sure. Um, I believe I have a million other things, but I want to get into the concept art. Yeah. So explain where all this concept art came from and the stuff you've been releasing online. During the script process, um, I, I love working with artists. I, I, one of my favorite parts about being a filmmaker is collaborating with various different artists and just spitballing ideas. And I say, what about this? What about this? And And then giving it to them and then they just I wake up in my email and I'll have all these sort of incredible images. And, and then we just rev revise and play around. And during the script process, I just, I had all these ideas in my head. And so I went to a lot of my favorite artists. I went to people that I had great relationships with on Kong. I went to people who I knew had uh, a grand love of Metal Gear. And then word kind of started to get out that I was doing this. So then I started suddenly, I was us had artists contacting me saying hey i hear you're uh i hear you're working on metal gear like can i get into this and it just became this labor of love and for me it's it's a process where a i just kind of need to like have a creative outlet to to mess around with some of this stuff b uh 
for me, you actually end up working things out in a script sometimes visually because you're playing with these ideas and you're like, oh, actually this can work or, oh, we should try and work some of this in. So some of it certainly is things that are representative in the film. Some of it is just pure exploration. Some of it's just pure love, wanting to see these things mashed up together. Um, and so it just, it was a, a couple months of me kind of like running my own art department uh, with a absolute like A-list Avengers quality a group of concept artists, guys who I am so thankful were a part of this, who um, are just at the top of the game. Sure, so we're gonna look at some pieces of the concept mm -hmm. art and you will actually explain uh, what's going on, what you're thinking. Indeed. Um, so let's... Uh, so this was one of the first pieces I released and this is uh, Rex outside of the traditional Shadow Moses environment. And to me, the reason I released this one first is, you know, it has a slightly photo real quality and A, it's important to me to, um, really, truly, and accurately capture Yoji Shinkawa's designs. Um, you know, the way Rex looks, the way so much of the things in Metal Gear look, the wheel doesn't need to be reinvented on this movie. You know, I want to accurately bring that stuff to life. And to me, this is just sort of like that, that sort of semi-photo real feel of, oh, this is potentially what a Metal Gear movie looks like outside of a video game for out, out form outside of a uh, just like a fun sketch. You know, it just ha it just had the weight and the mood of standing on this this airstrip, and instead of there being an airplane, instead of there being a tanks, there's Rex. There's this walking bipedal tank. Sure. What's the next one? Uh, so this is uh, this is sort of one of, one of those mashups that was just an exploration I wanted to do in my head. Um, this is uh, Cyborg Ninja, Gray Fox going against a gecko. And in the games, uh, those two things never actually face off. Those take place in different eras. And to me, part of it is, you know, if we are remixing things, if we are sort of reimagining things, but trying to also be very true to what's going on, I just wanted to see that. What does that look like next to each other? To me, Cyborg Ninja is one of the most iconic characters in uh, gaming to me. Like when that character shows up, when I played it as a child, it blew my mind. You know, and that to me is one of the most beautiful things about Metal Gear is you're in this very weighty world, right? They're speaking in these like very dense acronyms. The world's 100% serious. And then what Hideo Kojima does is he slowly pulls that rug out where you turn a corner and there's suddenly a guy floating in a gas mask. Or suddenly there's a cyborg ninja who has active camo slicing people up. And, and it's that slow sort of dip into like the surreal and the military surreal that I love so much. And so I just wanted to see those two characters go up against each other because the geckos and cyborg ninja are equally iconic in, in my mind and they've never been in a game together. I'm getting the vibe you actually know what you're talking about. <laughs> Let's move on to the next piece of concept art. Uh, so this is one that, speaking of military surrealism, this is one where there's a lot of stuff in the games that starts to bleed into horror. There's stuff that bleeds into survival horror. You know, the, there, are, there are very dark and sort of brutal tones sometimes in the games, some of which are actual visions, some of which are real. And, and so I just wanted to explore that vibe and really, uh, you know, I, I, I won't say whether this is a dream sequence, whether this is a drug trip, whether, <laughs> you know, whether this is truly happening, but I just really wanted to start to explore that what I, what I deem as um, military surrealism. When you, have you, the studio has seen all these? Or, yes. so yeah. I mean, is it sort of like you're walking in and being like, hey, this is what I'm envisioning for this, this is this? Yeah, but, but you know what, a lot of it is also, like I said, this was, this was uh, just a passionate thing where, yeah, a lot of these things relate to the script itself, but a lot of it was me just wanting to show the studio, like, this is how much of, this is how much of a crazy person I am. Completely. I just made this, Feel free to flip through it. <laughs> you know what I sure. mean, like. But, but uh, that I'll, I got to tell you though, that helps to an exec seeing stuff like this rather than just seeing it on the page, trying to imagine it. Well, one of the part of the reason this started actually was because Metal Gear is such a seminal franchise, right? It's sprawled for so long; it has so many fans, and yet when you go online and you Google Metal Gear art, because the games are so uh, so advanced, you generally just find screenshots. You find screenshots from the game. And then when you do find art, the art's generally just characters. 
It's like, oh, I'm drawing Revolver Ocelot, I'm drawing uh, Sniper Wolf, I'm drawing The End. It ends up being these, these character uh, portraits. And surprisingly, there was very few pieces of like keyframe concept art online that felt cinematic. And so part of this was me going out of my way to sort of say, well, I'm going to make these keyframes in this concept art because it's almost not there. And so I didn't want an executive having to go and look at cutscenes from the game. I didn't want an executive having to go and just look at screenshots from the game. I wanted to say, here's your movie. No, completely. It's on these pages. Completely. Let's look at the next uh, piece. Okay, so this is one of my favorites. Um, this is a diptych, and on the left you have sort of a 1960s, 1970s environment uh, with very like uh, prototype bipedal walking mechs. On the the right you have a much more modern environment with those geckos that have a much more biomechanical feel, and. It's just meant to be a diptych that actually shows the passage of time. Like I said, so much of Metal Gear, to me, is fundamentally just about this idea of the cycle of pain. And it's about these warriors that are trapped on the battlefield, and the only way to free themselves is death. Like, the winner is, is fated to remain there until they're killed. And I, I think there's, there's, there's such poetry to uh, Kojima-san's work, and there's such um, subtlety and loss baked into this franchise. And I just wanted to show that progression. I wanted one piece of art to almost take you through the timeline and see how nothing's changed. Sure. What's the next piece? Uh, this is uh, by Jakob Rosalski, who's actually in the studio right now. Um, this is one of my... Uh, we work together on Kong, and he draws these incredible... He paints these incredible portraits of just people in their environments with, like, mechs and monsters looming in the background. And I, I've, I've been obsessed with his work for so long, and... Um, and I reached out to him to, for Kong, and we, we collaborated on that. And then I, I reached out to him uh, for this stuff on Metal Gear, and he was like, you know, I don't, uh, I don't do freelance work anymore because his, his stuff is blown up. And I was like, please, 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 please. <laughs> and and he uh, just randomly one morning, I woke up to an email with uh, a couple pieces from him. And to me, you know, m so many of the Metal Gear games are, um, they're just based in these very isolated locations. And so you very rarely get to see how that technology spreads out into the rest of the world. And so a big part of that was a seeing it just, you know, as these farmers are just going about their day as as there's a mech in the background, but there's also that that odd mix of beauty and danger at the same time. And he's just one of the only people who can capture that. Uh, let's look at the next one. <laughs> so this is um one of the more iconic scenes in the franchise in my mind. Um, and one of the ones that most represents, I think, how the boss battles work. This is the death of Sniper Wolf. And to call it melancholy or morose, um, I think might be an understatement. It's, it's a battle that I think for many gamers, when you experienced it, it's one of the first times that you beat a boss, which should be a triumphant moment. And instead, you feel sadness. You feel like you're trapped. You're just as trapped as she is. And yet, somehow, she's free. And you have to go about your mission now. And um, to me, there's just, there's just a haunting nature to that. Um, I really it's really important for me in the movie to capture that sense of loss and that, that sense of sort of tragedy and the fact that like, even when you're winning, you're losing. Completely. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this was another one just trying to explore um, active camouflage, um, how that sort of resonates. You know, this is sort of slightly more Metal Gear Solid 4, uh, but with sort of Snake looking a little bit more like Metal Gear Solid, but really just trying to visualize ways to do active camo in a way that feels fresh from what we saw way back in the day with Predator. You know, like that, that, that invisibility cloaking effect has not really shifted that much in almost 30 years. And so it was just really trying to dig into what 
what materials, what textures, how does that blend into a wall and how do you show it in a way that's just not sci-fi and you disappear. So it was just really, you know, I was working with a, a really incredible artist on that, trying to just visualize what that looks like. And then beyond that, like Metal Gear to me is, like you said, it's about, it's about stealth and it's about the tension of stalking then like the high that you get when you're when you're stalking somebody but then the, the the panic that comes with being caught and so that that's an image to me that just there's a badassery associated with the fact that these guys have just passed but that can change in a dime in the metal gear world completely i think we only have a few more minutes so let's uh um <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, i can just power through some this is um uh, just a recreation of the iconic uh, hallway scene with Cyborg Ninja, which is one of my favorite scenes in the franchise. Uh, and I just wanted to see a proper piece of concept art on it. Uh, this also is just sort of a, an early um, exploration of what the geckos look like sort of in the outside environment. This is much more sort of Metal Gear Solid 4. Once again, people should not read into the casting based on uh, the likeness in this image. Um, but this is just sort of showing war. And to me, just seeing Snake sitting there being like, do I really have to deal with this? Um, so this is, this is also leaning into some of the more um, surreal horror elements. You know, Cyborg Ninja very famously is sort of trapped and, uh, and just tortured and can't free himself and he's waiting for someone to let like to, to free him and so this is not really something from the games but i just wanted to explore what does it look like to see cyborg ninja committing a form of seppuku uh, trying to just ram that katana through himself um to try and free himself and he can't and there's also hints of um uh the vr on the edges of that one uh this is another just recreation of the vibe of uh, Naked Snake, who becomes Big Boss, facing off with his mentor, The Boss. Uh, you know, there, there, there's such sort of beautiful, um, you know, almost like a movie like Hero, the way that a movie like this, I think, needs to play with color. And uh, if you go to the next one, I want to think it is, like this. So those two images, um, they they're like the A and the B side of the battle. And to me, one of the other things that's really important to capture in the film is that there is a sense of magical realism in this game. There, there's a sense of it's just stylization and sort of like heightened anime influenced Eastern stylization. But then there is a true sense of like things that are magically real. And that's important for me to capture in the film. You know, like I said, all of those quirks that would be very easy just to cut out, those are actually things to me that are very important to capture. This is another one by Jakob, and um, to me, it's just sort of taking those geckos, taking them out of this sort of war-torn desert environment, putting them in the snow, but then once again, seeing them with people that aren't just our, our, our spies. You know, I always describe Metal Gear sometimes as like, it's a spy movie with superheroes because that's how heightened all of the uh, all of the characters are. And so, you know, Jakob has this incredible ability to take these these mechs, but then put people around them, bring humanity around it. You know, these people are just going about their day slightly unbothered, like they probably just want to be fishing right now, and they're slightly interested in it. And like that type of humanity mixed with that sense of technology is important for me to sort of fuse into the film. And more than that, it just looks cool. And it looks awesome. Yeah. You'd be surprised how often on a movie you have to convince someone to do something Okay, and you have to justify why you're doing it, and in the back of your head, you just think, it just looks cool. Yeah. That's why we need to do it. So this is very much um, just another sort of representation of trying to get a slightly photo real feel of Hideo Kojima and Yoji Shinkawa's design, the, the blockiness, the bulkiness, like the, the, just to me, the iconic nature of how Rex looks but putting him in a real environment, putting him next to real soldiers. And also, if you know my work at all, you know I love sunsets and you know I love flares. And so this was <laughs> right up my alley. Completely. Uh, this was just an early sort of character piece, just wanted to show Revolver Ocelot, one of the, uh, one of the absolute through lines of the franchise. You know, he, oddly enough, when you first meet him, he just seems like 
this bastard of a character, and he, in many ways, is one of the main components of the franchise, and in a lot of ways, the heart of the franchise in a very strange way when you deep, get, uh, dig into the, the deep lore of it. Uh, this was just another one, just really trying to play with Rex in action. Just wanted to see, you know, so frequently the the mechs in the franchise, there's there's a giant build, it's this MacGuffin, it's it's a build up to this thing at the end and then you have to fight it, but you rarely see it actually like unleash. And so for me, this is just like the inner geek in me wanting to like really see what these cluster missiles look like out in an environment and like what the real force of these things are because so much of the Metal Gear is this idea of, okay, it's a walking nuclear tank. I understand the importance of that. I think we live in an age in which people have forgotten what true nuclear fear is. And in, instead, it's in the background. We've become desensitized to it. So yeah, in the games, like they can launch a nuke via a rail, a rail gun, which bypasses all normal treaties because it doesn't use rocket propulsion. But we're doing a lot of things in the movie that I think recontextualize what the purpose of a Metal Gear is, why it sort of is this, why, why it become, become a symbol and ways to make it relevant that I won't really go into, but I'm really excited about because I think it takes Hideo Kojima's work, and I think that it recontextualizes it for 2018 in a way that people have forgotten about mutually assured destruction. People have forgotten about nuclear proliferation. People have forgotten about what that type of nuclear fear is. And so I think that we've done a lot of work to make the Metal Gears themselves relevant in a very cool way. Um, I think we have time for, yeah, this might be our last oh. one. <laughs> this to me, I mean, like I said, there is not a scene in cinema to this day that I think captures the badassery of Cyborg Ninja, nor is there a scene in cinema that, that captures the kinetic nature of Raiden fighting the geckos in Metal Gear Solid 4. And I just wanted to see that classic Rocky standoff of Snake and Ninja just before they fight. To me, this really was going to this artist, Ben Morrow, and saying, I want Rocky. Like, you know, he initially, he had them much further away, and I was like, put them closer, put them closer. Like, I want them inches from each other's face, just squaring each other up. And will the scene be in the rain, what? <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> right, I'm just, I think I see some raindrops falling. There's definitely some raindrops there. You know? Um, hey, listen, uh, uh, we're basically out of time in the studio, and so I just want to say sincerely, um, I really hope you get to make this. Like, as a fan of yours, as a fan of the material, I think this is, it's just something really cool, and I think it could translate really well to the big screen. Uh, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I wouldn't be fighting for this if I didn't genuinely believe. <clears throat> to me, like, there's, there's Star Wars movies to talk about, there's all sorts of stuff to talk about. To me, this is that. This is this is a new frontier, not only I think for, for me as a filmmaker, but I just feel like for audiences. And to me, I think it, it's a way to make the first great, great video game movie that it doesn't even matter that it's based on a video game. It's filled with seminal characters, seminal moments. It's it, like the world has meaning and all of these quirks and oddities that we've been talking about, I just don't think people have seen on screen in that way. And that's right up my alley in terms of tone and style. And, uh, and it's just, it's been my baby forever. And so that's why I started making this art and collaborating with such an incredible group of people. Um, and I just believe in it. Like I believe that audiences are ready for something that is this smart and this entertaining and this badass. And you know, it's it yeah. it consumes me. Well, the other thing is that there's no movie like this. There's no like it's just a, like people want to go to the movies to see stuff they can't see on TV. And you're trying to create something that is obviously never been done. It's not even just the things they can't see on TV. I just like the reason that we got in. To movies is we were transported, we were taken, we were constantly shown new characters and new situations and new settings. And I think that's harder and harder for audiences to have. And I don't just think that's a byproduct of like, oh, films aren't as good. It's just with the internet, with everything, so much more is accessible to us. And so we have to work that much harder to make film that touches people in the same way that you and I as kids 
were like blown away by it. And to me, Metal Gear Solid is that. And Hideo Kojima's world is that. And so hell or high water, I will be fighting for this thing the rest of my life to not only shepherd the best version of it on screen, but because I just genuinely believe it's a world that people are ready to see and that by leaning into all of the crazy things that people may say, whoa, you can't adapt a Metal Gear movie because of this, 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 and this. I actually believe that that, 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 and that are exactly how yep. you make the rest of the world fall in love with it. Completely. Jordan, I'm so thankful you came in. I really hope that we are doing another talk, uh, um, you know, when the movie is <laughs> going. Uh, hey, listen, thank you so much. Thank you, man. Thank you for having me.